Um, I think quickly, because there are two new folks, uh, maybe we'll just do introductions and, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll start just because I'm unmuted. Um, so I'm Danny. Uh, I am a faculty member at Michigan State and the University of Oslo. Uh, I do computational physics education research. So I actually uh, don't just sort of implement and teach computation, but uh, my, my research is in how do students understand um, physics from computing and how do they understand computing from physics. Um, so uh, I just, just from my picture, we'll go down to Andrew maybe. Um, so I follow a path here. Sorry, yeah, um, Andrew Morrison and I teach physics at a two-year college near Chicago. It's Joliet Junior College, the country's oldest two-year college. Um, and I uh, have been interested in computation for a long time, ever since uh, I heard, uh, um, it was Larry, Larry Martin, was that it, from uh, North Park University? He gave a talk a long, long time ago uh, when vPython was just sort of getting started. Um, and this year, I finally implemented some coding projects in first year physics for engineering, engineering physics, which I had hesitated to do for a long time because I felt like um, my curriculum's super full to begin with, and I kind of felt like not a lot of people were doing computation at, in, the, in the first semester. Uh, but I did a, a little taste of it last semester, and I did more of it um, for the second semester, <clears throat> which I'm teaching for the first time in like six years for various reasons. Um, and, you know, I had some successes with it and some other uh, challenges, but um, really, I'm really interested in doing more. Cool. Uh, Marie, uh, in my window, you're next. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Marie Lopez del Puerto. I teach at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. And we got snow this morning. Or last night, I guess. <laughs> but it's all gone now. We're back to 50. Um, I've been teaching the modern physics course this semester and I've been using um, MATLAB and trying to do computational homework and computational labs, so some experiments and some computation annex, depending on what the lab is, um, and computational exams. So today my um, students had a computational exam, and um, I've been doing this for nine years now. This is my 10th time through this course, um, and it's always fun. Cool. Uh, Ernie, we're just doing quick introductions for a couple of new folks, so um, if you if you don't mind. Okay. Hi, I'm Ernie Berenger from Eastern Michigan University, and sort of recently <clears throat> joined into the, the whole Python game, and uh, also was involved in writing the computational physics recommendation for the APT. Cool. Uh, Josh, you're, you're next on my. Hi, everyone. I'm Josh Samani. I'm a lecturer at uh, UCLA in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And um, for the past year or so, my main computational implementation has been in these honors seminars that um, I created for Math method, upper division mathematical methods and for um, the lower division intro mechanics course at UCLA. Uh, this quarter I'm teaching a computational physics class for seniors and uh, just generally speaking excited about trying to integrate computation to all levels of the curriculum and uh, hearing what people's ideas are. And I'm actually particularly interested, Andrew, in um, the sort of elements of uh, you said there are certain successes and certain challenges and things um, implementing in, in the intro course more deeply the computation. So I'm kind of interested in, in going, doing more in intro courses and I'm a little bit concerned about the same thing, you know, the curriculum being pretty tight and all that. So um, I'm interested to hear more about that. Cool. Uh, Kelly, you're, you're next in my rotation. Hi, Kelly Roos, uh, Bradley University. Uh, 
this I'm starting, well, next fall I will be starting my 25th year of integrating computation into my physics courses. Uh, so I've, I've done about, I've, you name it, I've tried it, everything from Fortran and C to, to Mathematica and Python. So I, I guess you could say I'm an old campaigner in this. Um, by the way, Andrew, you missed the workshop this, this last weekend at the ISA PT. Yeah, shame on you. All right, I, I know. You we can talk about Delta and Atlanta uh, <laughs> for the whole time if you really want. Yeah, okay. Anyway, I went to, I, I, you're, you're probably going to make it to the one in Rockford coming up, I presume, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. We, you should, we should do a workshop together, but we will have plenty of time to work on this, all right? I want to talk to you about that. Yeah, certainly. All right, I shall stop talking now. Okay, uh, Michelle. <laughs> Hi, I'm Michelle Couchier. I'm a professor um, at Davidson College in North Carolina. Um, I'm a computational physicist. I do computational physics research, algorithm development, that sort of thing. Um, uh, it's my first year as a professor, so I'm currently teaching computational physics, so a lot of computation in that class. Um, last semester, I implemented computation into the intro level labs. Um, this year I'm not teaching, or this semester I'm not teaching an intro level lab, just the lecture, and I haven't implemented it there. So, that's all. Okay, uh, last person I have is, uh, James, but I suspect that is not your first name, is it? Uh, can you hear me? Hello? Okay, um, I'm Floyd James. I'm from North Carolina a &T. Uh, so I may have to go visit Davidson up the road to see what you're up to. I started in computation, I guess about 10 years ago. I went to the Schroeder workshops. I went to the, uh, sure, the Matter Interactions VPython stuff. I integrated, I created a computational intro course for our curriculum and I started to work on a computational concentration. And then I stopped. <laughs> so now it's time to start again. So now I'm starting to plan the computational physics concentration uh, for our school. And I guess I got on this list because I went to the pickup workshop in Atlanta. Cool, uh, thanks. All right, so um, I guess the idea here then is to just sort of do a little bit of a share out. Um, so I guess if they're, um, not particularly uh, sure where we want to start, but if, if people have sort of things that they've been doing that they want to share out, um, we could we could start there and see where how the discussion evolves. So I'll, I'll start because I realized I didn't actually say like it, I'm doing anything like this semester. <laughs> so there was like this long pause, and I'm like, what am I supposed to say? Anyway, so this semester I'm teaching an advanced uh, optics lab course, and what I'm finding is students need more practice in learning how to fit functions that are not lines. Okay, so anything that's not, you know, just exactly a straight line or a polynomial is something they need practice at, and so they need sort of the computational scaffolding to do that kind of laboratory work. So that's one of the things that's been good. Going on. I've also I'm also teaching an algebra-based intro course in ENM, and I've done a little bit of glow scripting, um, just uh, not asking the students to do computation, but rather just to use them as simulations, which isn't ultimately where I want to be, but it's it's where I'm at. <laughs> Ernie, how how are you given um, the students in your advanced optics course, what kinds of things are you having them do? I mean, you, you said you noticed that they're, they're struggling with these nonlinear fits and so forth. What, what, what are you having them work on? So uh, one of the more recent things is we have them uh, construct a, a laser where they have to uh, align the, the last mirror to make it laze, and then I have them measure a beam profile. So it's, uh, it's an error function fit. Um, that beam profile done with a knife edge and 
and basically I have to give them most of the code. Like uh, Eric Ayers has a pickup exercise set on curve fitting, and so we can start from there. And and even even with that amount of help, they still need a little bit of hand holding for that. Um, so so that's uh, one example. The other thing uh, we do is a, a light scattering experiment where the the functional form is a sine squared. And you know, so this is like two instances where you have nonlinear fits that they have to do. Um, so to me, it's it's sort of more evidence that you really have to provide the proper scaffolding and a lot of support. Have they ever seen like Law of Malice uh, before getting to your class? Not necessarily, um, but yeah, that's actually yet another, that's another of the fits that they have to do is we do a, a, a simple Malice's Law experiment, yes. And, and uh, the interesting thing, right, is in the textbooks, there's no offsets or anything, right? And so they have to sort of recalibrate that, oh, it's not an ideal, system this is real and there are offsets there's background etc I just I wonder if like I mean I almost never get to polarization in, in intro physics but uh, you know if there was a really simple like um, intro level version of that where you could take data and, and put it into something like logger pro and have logger pro do the the fit and then use that to, as the scaffold to get to the them doing the fit themselves. I don't know if that would um, be faster or just take up too much time. That's a good question. Um, I think if you have something like Logger Pro, um, the temptation is just to use Logger Pro right. and not, not to develop, say, a, a code that's more flexible. But one can argue about, you know, what, where do you want to spend your time and their effort? Cool. Uh, thanks, Ray. Cool. Other things people are working on, other, other interesting projects, things, things that you've noticed this semester you can share? I have something that I, I do want to share. Um, I'll try to share my screen. I don't know how this works, but whatever. Um, so one of the things that I kind of decided to do, um, I, I punched the share screen button. I don't know if that, oh, it's my computer's thinking. Uh, one of the, the, the things I decided to emphasize was um, uh, only doing uh, computation for like stuff that um, we can't do in class. And so um, this is uh, my trinket stuff. Um, and one of the things that I was working on myself was um, if I have a, a ring of charge and then another charge comes in and interacts with that, um, what does it look like? And so I think, I think this is it. Um, so the, what I wanted to do was um, you know release a charge near a fixed uh, near the fixed ring and then um, watch it accelerate towards the ring and then um, oscillate back and forth if it's right on the the center line uh, and, and that that'd be kind of cool and that's something like we don't we don't do the oscillation um, you know math in in the class we could it's, it's actually not that hard um, but I wanted to get to the point where we would release the charge not on the center line, and then like it, uh, the oscillation wouldn't be so simple. Um, and um, this is my code, and I'm not not entirely sure if you can see the animation, but um, it it worked really really well. Other than um, I never got the I'm not great at like optimizing this, um, and so. It's kind of there's 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 actually quite a lot of calculation going on, um, and so it 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 runs kind of slow and clunky or whatever. Um, but I you know on a personal level I thought that was really cool 
that that was something that, you know, I could come up with and then show the class and whatever, and then try to um, have them be inspired to do something uh, similar or actually just really more simple and then like work up to that if they really wanted to. Um, and you know, that, that was, that was one of the things that I, <laughs> it's, that really encapsulates the, uh, having minor successes, but there were a lot of ch challenges along the way because there was just a, a, a ton of, uh, well, I had several students who were, were very resistant to this, and I was very surprised by that. So, a Andrew, what what preparation do they have when they get to this uh, exercise? Let's call it. So, okay, so for this one, um, we had done. Um, I started with the electric field um, of a single charge, and a, like a single point charge, and and they had to modify that and then um actually i should go back to this uh i don't know if you can see like all the shares and remixes and whatever that's these are you know students had access to this and they were modifying it and, and, hmm. and so on and mm -hmm. so forth um so after we did the electric field of a single point charge then it was the electric field of two point chart two point charges and oh yeah this one so this was the the starter code and they had to make changes to it mm -hmm. to like there was a goal for this one yeah so there were um oh they started with this the same code as as the single point charge but then they they had to add a second point charge mm -hmm. at a particular location so on and so forth the other preparation that they had was that um so I had 24 students in the class and um all but three of them I think it was had had me last semester mm. and we had done some rudimentary coding um with you know uh forces and, and whatever mm -hmm. um but i don't think many of them remembered they remembered that we had done it but i don't think they remembered any of the uh syntax or details or, or whatever so um and, and so, do you, yeah do you do this in in your labs then or well, we use a studio physics approach, so okay. the the lab is integrated seamlessly. Okay, okay. So. How many hours a week do you meet? Just curious. We meet uh, six hours a week. It's uh, mm -hmm. uh, seven contact mm -hmm. hour, five credit, so it's mm -hmm. six clock hours, if you will. Gotcha. So you're so you have the flexibility to do whatever you want when during during any period, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, cool. And do you does your would you say that your style is to provide them with um, some kind of working code and have them modify it versus uh, have them start from scratch? Well, actually, so I, um, <laughs> here's the, uh, I should preface this with, um, I belong to a local community maker space that I've been a part of for six or seven years. And I've been playing with Arduinos, for example, for, I don't know, a few months after Arduinos came out. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I came to, and I run like local workshops at, at um, libraries and at the makerspace for how to program Arduinos and do stuff mm -hmm. like that. And about two or three years ago, I came to this realization that, um, you know, I'd, I'd spent all this time with Arduino and, um, you know, it, it was after working with it for, for four or five or six years that that was like, there was one day that I had this idea for this project with, for an Arduino project. And I sat down and I opened up this blank screen and I just started pounding away and, 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 you know, coding up the thing that I wanted. And I stopped and I realized like, it was like the first time that I had ever um, started with a totally scratch thing that, you know, wasn't just a modification of a modification of a modification, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I realized that, you know, it took me, several years to get to the point where I could myself like write code from scratch and that I, I got to that point by doing a lot of reading of code, like reading code is as important as being able to write it. And so to start from scratch with just like writing your own, you're actually like, you're always going to be copying somebody's code anyway. So um, I really believe that 
the students, we have to teach students how to, how to read code and we have to, um, you know, honor the idea that a lot of people are just, when you're writing your code, you're, you're modifying some, your own code or somebody else's code or something. And so why not like start with that from the beginning? So what mm -hmm. I tend to do is I, I oftentimes don't give them fully working code, but it's sort of like a, a framework or a, a very minimally working code. Um, and then we just, we go from there, we build on, on it. So that's, that's sort of how I, um, how I approach it. Gotcha. Interesting. Well, uh, by the way, everybody, I don't mean to, uh, to, uh, dominate the interview here. <laughs> so jump in and ask questions. If you have, this is, this is really looks pretty cool to me. I can stop sharing. I don't know if I, I don't, I don't really have anything else to, to add to my mm -hmm. go and tell. Yeah. Um, I, I will say, I guess, that I was inspired to do that ring a charge thing because I had made a code where um, I, I did the problem where you drop a ball through um, a, a shaft in the earth and you mm -hmm. watch that, that oscillate. And I mean, right. the electric ring, I mean, it's the same physics, the same sure. math. Sure. Um, and I, I had a lot of fun with that one because like you can put a skin on the, on a ball that looks like the earth. And mm -hmm. so I, I have a, uh, hmm. an earth that is like partially transparent and you can see the ball. And then I also, you can make the earth rotate. And so, you know, there's a lot <laughs> of fun things that you can do with it that are, um, there's, there's actual physics to all the stuff I'm doing, but it's, it's not necessarily, uh, I mean, it's, it's separate from the computational physics that we're trying to also really emphasize. Right. right. Yeah. You mentioned that there were there, you said there were maybe three students that didn't, or, a handful of students that didn't get into this. What do you think that was all about? Well, you know, so I'm at a two year college. We have a diverse, you know, set of students. And mm -hmm. um, I had one student who um, it, it was, it was very much a personality thing that he's just struggling with. Um, and uh, you know, he, he's an interesting case because he wants to be a paleontologist and I'm not entirely sure mm -hmm. why he's taking engineering mm. physics but he mm. came in my office and he told me that he sees no reason why um he'll ever have to know how to write code because it has nothing to do with measuring the length of a tibia or something and whatever <laughs> so that was a struggle um but then i have another student who is um you know she's a 38 year old uh single mom and trying to go back to school become an engineer and um She's a hard, hardworking student. She works full time mm. uh, and studies really hard, but she's really traded at her computer. You know, she'll spend two hours banging her head on mm. a Microsoft Word problem. Um, and so, I, I don't know. It's mm. those two were the two of the three that I didn't have last last semester and they basically decided, well, I've never coded before. And so I can't learn to code. And I'm like, that's like opposite of everything I set up my class to be about just in terms yeah. of like, it's not even about coding. It's like, you're learning something new. Um, mm -hmm. That's why you're here. Like I'm here to help you learn that thing that's new. And so like, let's, let's figure it out together. Right. So I don't know if this helps at all, but I have coded uh, a program that actually was measuring like the length of bones. <laughs> I, would love, I would love to see that. that was, that was <laughs> yeah, good. tell, go tell I, thought, well, that's yeah. I actually don't know what part of the body they came from. Like people brought us these bones that they couldn't <laughs> touch. And then we had to scan what? them and take measurements and hmm. then learn about, well, the archaeol or whatever they were paleontologists, yeah. they learned something about it. But oh, that's that's really cool. I you know, perfect. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I uh, oh man, I I had um, <laughs> this was about a year ago, so it wasn't this year, but a year ago I had um, a couple of uh, well, I had I had a uh, someone from the the uh, the the, the uh, county like medical examiner's office in my in my in my office um like 
handing me MRI scans of a skull that they had imaged and they wanted me to stitch it all together and, and come up with a 3D printed skull. And um, that was super fascinating. It had nothing to do with like uh, physics. And, sure. Like, you know, someone told them that I'm a 3D printing guy and then I got a phone call out of the blue and then they show up and detectives show up and it was, it was really <laughs> interesting. So I should have actually told the student about that. Um, but yeah, that's, right. that's, really, that's a great story. Thank you for yeah. that. So, so I got a question. You mentioned that you did the ball dropping into the center of the earth, which meant you had to give a spherical mass distribution. How did you do that? Um, so I used a very simple model where um, you assume that the, it's a terrible model. Um, where you assume that the earth is, is uh, uniform density um, and you get a pretty good estimate. And there's, there's an interesting, I think it's AJP paper that compared um, the uh, three different models of how, um, how you can get the, the density of the earth. Um, there's like a realistic model and then there's like the, the, the fake model that I was using. And then um, there's something like in between or whatever. And it's really fascinating that uh, between those three, like the difference in the time that it takes the ball to, to go through the earth is like, it's, it's like, I don't know, it's, it's a it's, it's small fraction. It's like 10% or 20%. It's really, really surprisingly, um, you can get very close with a very bad model. So I was not using a good model. Oh, oh, so you did the, if you're this point in the earth, then the gravitational force is this as opposed to simulating the whole planet right yeah it's like okay, um, all right got it right it's like the mass version of gauss's law sort of thing so, okay got it yeah cool uh any other stuff people are doing or interested in you know yeah i was going to share something i'm interested in and recently got interested in but I have, haven't done anything about it myself. Um, so I, I just keep hearing about machine learning everywhere. And it's just so hot right now. And my students want to learn about it. Everyone wants to learn about it. People want to get jobs in it. You know, it's just the hottest thing in the world, apparently. So I started learning about machine learning. And um, I started contacting faculty in my department who use machine learning to see if it's possible to integrate this into undergraduate curriculum because it seems like such a blossoming field and I'm sure a lot of undergrads are going to be using it if they go into careers in data science. So, you know, if, if anyone has been using machine learning or knows, uh, has any ideas about implementing it in undergrad curriculum, I'd love to hear about that. So I do machine learning in my research. Um, we have in our computer science department, we have both a machine learning course and an artificial intelligence course, um, which like right now with where I'm at, like I tell students who are interested in doing research with me to take those classes. Um, but I'm also interested, and I haven't done anything with this, um, I teach you know, a sophomore level computational physics class and um, I've been told that perhaps I could teach an upper level class as well. And that one I plan to do some machine learning in. Um, that being said, I haven't done that. <laughs> so maybe that doesn't help you at all, but at least um, uh, I'm also listening. I, I got a dumb question for you. Are, we, are you talking something like a neural neural network sort of machine learning thing? Okay. What, what type of approach do you, or maybe it's, what type of approach do you use, Michelle, in your research topics? I mean, I'm just uh, curious. But. I mean, I'm probably most known for using Bayesian neural networks. Oh, all right. Um, just because, like, that's what my PhD was yeah, on. Yeah, I was just, and, yeah, okay. Um, and in Believe my, it or not, I know what that is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And actually, it's really great. So go, teaching computational physics this semester with, with Mark Newman's book, um, we talk about a lot of the pieces 
mm-hmm. that go into making the Bayesian neural network algorithm without the without the learning aspects. So mm-hmm. just like the basic idea of what supervised machine learning is, which it's a supervised machine learning method, and how we can use methods essentially that we already know, put together methods we already know to create um, a method that will learn. Hmm. So it's possible for it for okay. people who have at least gone through Newman's book to yeah. pick up that algorithm. Hmm. So I'm wondering, um, you know, the, the, the context in physics or astronomy that I know about uh, that I've heard about recently is um, sifting through astronomical data, and in particular things like um, identifying galaxies or galaxy clusters or whatever. Um, I don't really know any astronomy, but um, tasks like that, but I haven't really heard about machine learning in the context of um, physics very much. So I'm wondering if if you have any insights on like what sorts of applications people use it for physics. So I see it a lot in um, in the big experiments. So like I initially did it with work with the LHC and the C- the CMS group at the LHC. They do a lot of machine learning um, to pick out signals, um, sort background from from signals. Um, actually, a lot of different areas, and then. Um, we started to use it now as we're developing bigger detectors in nuclear physics at Michigan State. Um, so I know, like, th- those are my areas that I know. And I see a lot of um, people, so even, um, well, like, getting into research areas I don't know a lot about, but, like, the long baseline experiments, um, I think that they also use machine learning methods. So I think it's everywhere in physics research. And um, it's it's used pretty easily in cases where you're essentially doing image analysis because that's where a lot of um uh like packages have already been developed in in non-physics areas that you can use um and so i see like convolutional neural networks and like the deep learning type things where people can use um or build off of what other people have done if you kind of have these images uh which you do get a lot in physics experiments do you think it would be hard to get access to like sort of somewhat small manageable data sets that we could give to a student and give them a little project, like a little machine learning project to work on in say like a couple of weeks? No, I think that that's, I think that that's totally doable. Like often when I'm trying a new method, you do the simplest of things like something that, so normally you'd use it on, something that's high dimensional so it's hard to fit or something like that but you can do it on something that you know the answer to so that's that's obviously and it's simple to plot or something like that so with like supervised machine learning methods I have this one where I take like a plot like I have a list of x values and y values and then I have this target that's a sine of x times cosine y and that's a test data set where I know what like if I'm plotting things I know what it should look like and things like that like just super simple things to learn Um, and also like finding things in images like but really basic images like can you find a circle in this image of a circle now what if there's two circles or something like that Um, which isn't the physics per se but then it you could then do something physics-y after that. (laughs) Cool. Um, other thoughts, ideas? I have something that I can show y'all. Uh, I don't know how useful it will be. Um, so uh, one of the things that I've been working on in my upper level course is how to sort of integrate more um, computing actually into it, into the actual instruction. So um, so right now I'm teaching advanced ENM uh, 2 uh, for majors. And I'll be teaching it again next year. So this past year, I taught it a little bit with a little bit of computing, but I didn't actually do any computational instruction in the class because I found it really well awkward. The lecture courses or the lecture rooms that we teach in make it really awkward to sort of do all of those things at the same time. 
Uh, but then I went to Norway and I learned about a piece of software called Doc Once, uh, which is if I can share my screen. Hold on, I think it's actually it must be this guy. What are you seeing? <laughs> Am I sharing my screen? Are you seeing? Did you see a, 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 a cat? Sorry. Yes. The Norwegian okay. cat. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. That's the right thing that I was I was meant to show you because I think that was the right. Okay. So this is a this is a um, set of slides that we are working on for our, our faculty uh, to integrate computation. <clears throat> so I'll show you what it can do, and then I'll show you what the thing actually is. So basically, it makes slides in Reveal, which is right a web based sort of uh, uh, presentation software it's relatively simple so forth um, yada 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 a bunch of crap because the person who uh, developed this uh, likes to write lots of things so it actually it handles um, markup uh, that is you know latex markup so you can actually have um, you know equations and so forth so here well basically this is just talking about you know to our faculty we can solve lots of different two-point boundary value problems. We can do them in a lot of different ways. We should think about maybe how we do that in our courses and so forth. Um, there's some discussion of the Toplitz matrix and how you can turn this problem into an, an eigenvalue problem um, and how it can be used for lots of different kinds of problems, including the you know um, solving for the uh, energies in the um, uh, hydrogen atom uh, or hydrogen-like atoms, if you will. Um, but eventually. It gets to this idea, sorry, he has a lot of stuff here. Um, so this is Python code that's actually inside of the reveal, um, uh, uh, I guess, presentation. Um, that code can be evaluated live. Um, it's apparently powered through SageMath. And so you can get a plot. So this is one of the eigenvalues, and this is a plot. Um, of this radial probability as a function of r um, sitting inside of this presentation. So like never left the presentation, um, the code is in there, um, and so forth. Now the other thing I'll show you is what does that look like when you write it, and it has a really funky syntax, but it's kind of like a markdown syntax um, that is not terribly hard to learn if you are used to uh, hold on here, sorry, it's this guy. If you're used to doing some sort of markdown. Um, so in this particular, can you all see the, the, you probably can't really read it in detail, but um, there's some title, there's some author, some date, um, mm -hmm. the slide titles, there's figures and so forth. The interesting thing is, sorry, I'm just gonna scroll all the way down. So. Um, Looks like the Atom Editor, right? It is the Atom Editor, yeah. So here's here's just actual math. So this is just LaTeX that gets processed by it. Mm -hmm. um, so you can type your regular LaTeX into it. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, let me get all the way down there eventually. Um, once you've installed Doc Once, um, here it is. Um, so here's that Python code that I showed you. Um, so it's set off by this sort of begin code command here. Um, and then this is actual code in Python. And that's what you would have seen in detail. Um, and it can be evaluated. Essentially, um, that begin code, end code tag gives you code in there that you can go through and run and evaluate. And it runs through Sage Math Cloud and shows you the figure. The other thing that it does, this is one last. So the thing about doc once is the name is not just a slightly clever name, I guess. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's not really that clever. It's odd. Um, is, uh, sorry, I gotta do it by terminal because I have some problem here with my, where I'm located. Um, nope, that's not what I want. Um, basically, it can create lots of different kinds of things. So lots of different kinds of file formats, sorry. Um, so if you, for example, at the same time, so all that is just uh, markup, right? Um, uh, and it processed it into a reveal situation. Um, but it can also, where did that open? Sorry. 
somehow I ended up with a full screen uh, Zoom app, and I don't know how I did that because I didn't request it. But you know, you get things that you don't request. Um, there's a joke there about Donald Trump, but we'll leave it at that. Uh, here we go. So this is a PDF that was generated from the exact same markup. Um, so this is some write-up that could be handed to students in some way, and it has the same um, LaTeX in there, and I think eventually when you get to the code, it'll have the code written up. Um, it can also do handouts of the same kind of thing. It can, it can render it into IPython notebooks. So like all of that text will be text, and then there'll be IPython notebooks that you can edit. Um, so it has lots of different kinds of features to it uh, in the sense that um, you kind of, you write it once in this doc one syntax, and then you know you can process it. It can be processed into a variety of different kinds of things, um, so that you can use it in class as a as a presentation. You could you know use the exact same syntax to generate a homework or an exam problem or what have you. You can use the same thing to you know um, generate a LaTeX document that the students could work from and so forth. Um, it's it's surprisingly uh, flexible, uh, to be honest. Uh, so, this is something that I'm going to probably start moving my markdown slides to um, uh, next semester so that I can start including code. <laughs> Do, can you spell that out, what you're, what you're saying, Danny? Yeah. Doc once? Yeah, D O C O N C E. Huh, all right. Doc once. Yeah, I can and say it. And is there a package that you just install this into your Atom editor? Or? Ah, it's not that trivial, as it turns out. Um, I can share stuff with you that makes it more trivial. So essentially, it's a, um, there it is there. It's a uh, <clears throat> okay. a GitHub repository that has it. Um, uh, essentially, you just build it. So you, you, would, you clone the repository. Uh, then you use Python to just um, set it up. It needs a couple of libraries, which it doesn't actually tell you that it needs, which is fun um, to find out later. So um, if you need help setting it up, let me know. Um, once it's it's set up and sort of linked to your Python installation, it's pretty uh, straightforward to do all of the things. The the syntax is a little bit um, a little bit of a learning curve, but if you've used like Markdown or if you've used um, you know, uh, LaTeX or something, it's kind of similar. It has just its own sort of curiosities about it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what was the other thing I was going to mention about it? Oh, so um, it has its own sort of commands. So it, it becomes basically an application that you are like a, like a uh, command that you can call in the command line. Um, the thing to do is actually build a, a make file that does all the things you want it to do. And I have some of those that I'd be willing to share that just essentially just generate all the things. You just call it once and it generates everything you need um, without having to remember its, its particular syntax. Uh, so this is the coolest thing I've seen this week. Um, can you clarify a couple of things? First of all, so you said reveal and doc once. What's reveal? And also, when you were saying that it's um, it the code executed from the browser using Sage Math Cloud, which meant that it wasn't running locally, but it kind of looked like it was running locally. Can you just clarify those things for me? Yeah. So, um, so uh, doc basically, doc once is a markup language, um, and so uh, it's a markup language. Um, like LaTeX or HTML or Markdown or whatever, but it can generate it can generate LaTeX, it can generate Sphinx, it can generate HTML, IPython notebooks, Markdown, MediaWiki, um, uh, and then those things can be post-processed. So like it can generate LaTeX, and then in your make file you can have it call all the things to make PDFs in different ways. Um, the reveal is essentially the HTML that it can generate. So um, you can tell it to generate HTML in the style of reveal, which is a um, uh, essentially a JavaScript, a set, a set of JavaScript codes that um, allow you to make entirely web-based presentations. So they, they don't, um, they don't require uh, like PowerPoint or keynote or what have you. They're written in plain, um, they're written in HTML, but a lot of, a lot, what a lot of things do is actually, take Markdown and pipe it to um, 
the form of HTML that uses that reveal um, JavaScript. Um, so can I ask for the I'm, I, I'm a little confused then um, because uh, I'm familiar with reveal and um, if you when you were showing it what I assumed was that you had um, written all the reveal stuff and then put in some extra stuff the doc once thing inside the reveal is that what you did or did you nope. did you, you did the doc once yep. and then that generated reveal yeah so i can show you the other the quick thing i could show you if i can get to it quickly is here let's do it really really fast here um so this is uh let's see if it'll open so here's the make file that is written for this. So when I want to create a um, reveal uh, document, there's there's a series of tags or a series of of uh, options that you put in that Doc once understands, and it just it grabs those things from its own package and sort of just you know it uses its markup um, to uh, uh, know when to basically make like slide breaks and so forth. So there's special little commands like that it interprets when you compile it in a certain way, but it, it dispenses with when you compile it in another way. For example, the there's a split command that you put in that would um, that gets read in by the the compile when you make it a reveal presentation, but it gets thrown away when it's when it's a LaTeX document, right? So it, so it just generates the whole LaTeX document without that stuff. But if you say I want to reveal document, it, it it parses that as something that's important. So um, and then there's some there's a there's a bunch of stuff here, but all of those all of those are shareable and and just sort of like to kind of learn by editing or or making changes to it and, and uh, so forth. Sorry, so there was a, Michelle. I think you had another question. I don't remember what it was. Oh, I was just, I think what you didn't answer is um, where the Python or whatever you had, the code was running. Yeah, that's a good question. I have not yet un unpacked where that is happening exactly. It says powered by Sage Math Cloud. I haven't tried to use it on a machine that doesn't have certain packages or something to see if it fails mm -hmm. or tried it without an internet connection to see if it fails because it's not clear to me i haven't actually um i mean the i guess the easiest thing to do would be to view the source on that particular slide and see what it's doing um i haven't done that yet <laughs> okay <laughs> so that's my share And you're going to share that with us, right? <laughs> yes. I mean, well, well, share. I can share the files. Anything that you want, you're welcome to. I'll take it all. Sure. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, so I should say that um, the documentation is a little hard to parse. It took me probably a, a, a week or so to really sort of learn, mm -hmm. like, or to for it to become more intuitive and to know what I'm looking for um, because they also uh, refer to things. The documentation refers to things in strange ways because it's written in, well, it's written in English, but it's written in English by people whose second or maybe third language is English. Um, so the words that you might use for certain things are kind of hard to remember sometimes, mm -hmm. or they're not exactly the words that we might use. Okay, well, it's about five minutes to 10. Um, so uh, folks have any other things they would like to chat about? Um, or are we feeling pretty good? Josh left us. Oh, he must have hated Doc once. Cool, okay. Um, so I guess I'll go ahead and stop the recording. Um,